How wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to discuss a somewhat bizarre mystery that appeared on our planet approximately a decade ago. And specifically, very unusual holes, one of which you can see right here, that suddenly appeared in the ground in certain locations in northern Russia. But specifically, they seem to be formed by some kind of an incredible explosion, with tons of soil and massive blocks of ice hurled hundreds of feet into the air. But these were not volcanic eruptions and not results of meteor impacts or some bizarre military tests by Russia or uh, aliens. Because turns out that these were actual physical phenomena that are now happening because of the thawing of permafrost in some very specific locations. And so technically this is now referred to as GECs, giant gas emission craters. Super mysterious formations that were very challenging to explain for over a decade and first spotted back in 2012 in very remote parts of western Siberia. And intriguingly, if you go on Google Maps, or Google Earth in this case, you can actually find them and you can see them yourselves, with I think this one right here, known as the Yamal Crater, being the most famous one. And so because this was such a bizarre discovery and because we've never seen anything like this, back in 2012 this kind of became a global sensation. But mostly because of what they were like. First of all, all of them were near vertical structures and cylindrical in shape, and very often at least 50 meters deep. But more importantly, this was an indication of something ridiculously powerful and something we've obviously never seen before. But here there was a central puzzle. Why exactly do these unusual objects, these GECs, only form in this very specific region, essentially limited to this location right here, the Yamal and Gaiden Peninsula? And for some reason they were not visible anywhere else where we detect permafrost and where we technically expect something very similar. And so none of the other Arctic regions seem to have these. And so if this was, for example, the result of, I guess, global warming, why only here and why nowhere else? And well, this is the mystery we're going to be discussing today, because it looks like it was finally solved in this recent study by Helge Halibank and the team you see right here. And this was on the formation of giant Siberian gas emission craters. And so today we're going to look at what we know about these geological events, why they happen where they do, and why they're also an important indicator of much larger changes happening to our planet, and I guess what's going to happen next. But first, I guess let's discuss some of the previous propositions. And so for many, many years, previous models tried to explain these objects using processes that seem to happen within permafrost layer itself. And many of these propositions very often focused on the idea known as talic. Talic refers to a kind of a historic lake created in the thaw zone, or the unfrozen ground within permafrost, that some studies suggest traps a lot of different gas from a lot of thawing ice and then dissolves various hydrates, which creates certain chemical reactions. But this didn't really explain everything. Here there was actually a major drawback. Features like ground ice and additional features known as cryopags or pockets of very salty water are actually quite widespread in many Arctic locations. They're not just present here. And so if all of this was the result of some kind of a lake interaction or something in regards to super salty water, these GEC should be forming pretty much everywhere where we have permafrost. Yet they weren't. Something very specific was happening in Yamal and Gaiden regions, and something that could not just be explained with these underground lakes. And so I guess what makes these regions so unique? Yamal and Gaiden regions. Well, there are actually quite a few features that make these regions quite unique. For example, enormous gas deposits. This particular area of West Siberia is what's known as a hydrocarbon province. It contains a lot of natural gas resources, with the Yamal Peninsula alone containing 26 trillion cubic meters of gas. And it just so happens that a lot of these bizarre structures are often found in proximity of a lot of active gas fields. Then there's also something related to geological heat and geological faults. And because of this, in this region, the permafrost varies strongly in thickness. Sometimes it's up to 500 meters, but sometimes it's only a few tens of meters. And so because of this, this potentially forms very specific geological weaknesses or geological cracks that seem to run deep into the earth, with many of these faults acting as pathways. And these deep faults bring two crucial ingredients to the base of the permafrost. They bring natural gas and heat. So basically they act as a kind of a funnel where a lot of this gas and heat suddenly accumulate because of the permafrost structure underneath. And so the sudden influx of gas and heat from deep below starts deforming and melting the bottom of permafrost, especially in the locations where it's naturally much thinner. 
and though this process usually takes at least a few years, eventually develops a dome of gas and a lot of heat right at the base of this relatively thin permafrost. With this permafrost basically acting as a kind of a lid, but in this case, a lid that's only a few meters across and that's much thinner than in other locations. With all of this sort of summarized in this new model for how all of this works. This is now the GAC formation model that's basically described in this paper. And here there are four main stages. First, the building stage. This is when natural gas from underneath slowly migrates underneath the ground and starts to accumulate in certain domal structures with the additional heat that usually travels along with it, causing some of the permafrost to start thinning even more and to start slowly melting. Naturally, this leads to overpressure underneath, but only in very certain locations. Then we have the second stage, or I guess the second step, the catastrophic failure. And in this case, it seems to be the result of the global warming. So basically here, the global climate change comes into play. Because the average temperature in many of these areas has been rising, the permafrost seal starts to thin even more, which slowly makes the gas underneath, the pressurized gas, move closer and closer to the surface. And when the pressure underneath is too great and the permafrost itself is too thin, the seal can no longer hold, with the mid part of the seal failing explosively, releasing fluids, ice and sediment into the air. And here we're talking about massive forces. This basically results in a relatively large explosion, with huge chunks of ice up to one meter across, dramatically ejected around the crater. And that's of course what's observed in most of these locations. But furthermore, the rapid release of gas from saturated waters creates a kind of a champagne effect. Effect that drives even more mass out of the crater, which eventually leaves behind a near perfectly cylindrical structure that's essentially been observed in many of these locations. But that was just the first two steps. Then we have step three and step four, which happen after the eruption. And so now this crater, that's essentially just a whole depressurized space, can no longer carry the weight of the surrounding layers, leading to further collapse and the formation of concentric folds around the edge. And that's something you see very well in this picture. And during the final step, the crater fills with sediment and water and basically becomes some kind of a lake with this whole structure now turning into peat. And so over time, they begin to look like ordinary thermocarst lakes. Lakes that usually form from thawing ice. Which also suggests that the true number of these structures in reality might be much higher because many of them potentially already became these lakes and just look a little bit different. As a matter of fact, here on the map, you can actually see quite a lot of very similar structures that do resemble circular lakes that might have started as these explosions. But according to this study, this is not the end. As a matter of fact, there is also a chance that this might happen again. As in the system can actually recharge itself, because the gas in this case is still going to be migrating underneath, and if permafrost regrows itself in certain locations, it can actually create another seal, allowing for more pressure to build up in the future, and for this process to repeat again. And so all of this can be basically summarized in this picture right here. We have the eruption stage, followed by the masking stage, which can technically become the eruption stage again if the permafrost forms a new seal. But I guess the question is, so does this actually matter and what is this showing us? Well, the thing is these GCs are a direct, visible and violent manifestation of a much larger effect. The permafrost degradation driven by climate change. And that's because generally the Arctic permafrost acts as a colossal freezer that normally stores huge amounts of hydrocarbons but when this permafrost starts to thaw and starts to degrade, and as it starts releasing these trapped gases, either through explosion or just by seeping through, it starts to release a lot of gases that have been trapped in there for thousands and thousands of years. And one of the primary gases it tends to release is methane. And it just so happens that not so long ago, we've discussed a sudden dramatic increase of methane that was actually not accounted for, and there's a very high chance it's possibly coming from the permafrost from a lot of these locations where it was basically hidden for thousands of years. And it just so happens that methane is an extremely potent greenhouse gas, which means that it might actually create a feedback loop where more methane causes more permafrost to melt, which leads to even more methane being released, with the cycle repeating itself many times. And so the main concern in this case is this bizarre positive feedback. If the permafrost keeps thawing and releasing more gas, it will be almost impossible to stop this, just because it's essentially a kind of a self-sustaining mechanism. And in this particular case, these structures essentially show us a kind of a permafrost failure, possibly showing us some of the first indications that we're about to enter a new climate era. But based on the study, we can also assume that these GECs 
also formed sometimes in the past, and specifically during past warm periods such as the Holocene climate maximum 8000 years ago, which may have produced very similar structures and which are now possibly just a bunch of lakes in this region. And so by learning more about what happened in the past, in order to understand what we might have to deal with in years to come. And so by understanding the specific mechanism for these GECs, this might help us prepare for the climate change a little bit better. But I guess in summary, so at least now we know these are not just some random explosions and seem to be a direct result of very deep geological interactions involving gas, heat and throwing permafrost. But also an event that seems to be accelerated by modern atmospheric warming and possibly something that happened in the past and something that's going to happen even more frequently in years to come. But obviously this is still just a conceptual model and more field work is required to see if this is actually correct. And so hopefully in the next years, once there is more studies and once even more such holes are discovered, because at the moment only 8 are known, we'll finally be able to understand and predict this even better and figure out if this is something to worry about. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining a channel membership that grants you early access and a few secret videos. Alternatively, you can also buy the wonderful person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.